I'm uh, Tilo, I'm a manager at uh, Microsoft. And I'm Andy, I'm a principal product manager at Microsoft as well. Um, and for those of you who have followed me on Twitter, you may see I got here to Valencia from Berlin by train. And if you take a train and you look out of the window at any of the goods yards or places you might see shipping containers, uh, you will see pictures like this, a container, and how do they get it on the rails? Well, that thing that it's sitting on is called a flat car. So that's where the name flat car comes from. Um, for, uh, for the flat car container Linux, it's a minimal lightweight foundation for running containers on. Pretty simple. Uh, makes sense when you know that. Um, so what do we mean by a container Linux? Uh, really, there's kind of four key attributes. The first is it's a minimal distro. So if you're running containers, most of the dependencies that you need are contained within the container. Um, the distro itself doesn't need a whole lot of baggage along with it, so it can be really small, if you, you know, uh, really uh, pretty minimal. Um, the second aspect is that we want to design this for security. We make the actual file system that the OS is running in immutable, and there's a whole category of exploits which exploit the fact that you can change the running OS, and um, those just don't, don't work on on an immutable uh, file system, so it's a secure environment. Another aspect of security and manageability is the fact that it's a built-in update system, so it takes automated update, uh, you know, applies updates as they're available on an automated way, policy-based way, and um, you, know, you can update them according to schedule or whatever policy you apply. And then the last piece is declarative provisioning, and really in the same way that we think about workloads as, and nodes as, um, you know, as kind of disposable infrastructure as code, we should be thinking about provisioning our operating system in the same way. Uh, so you have uh, effectively very simple bits of code which define how the node is provisioned. And what this all adds up to is operational simplicity for security and manageability when you're deploying at scale. So, you know, deploying one or two nodes in your home lab, running Kubernetes on it, probably not a problem. When you're deploying hundreds or thousands, these kind of issues really come to bite you, and it's where you really start to see a difference. Um, in fact, you know, there's a great quote. We did a, a case study. Equinix Metal actually migrated their uh, bare metal cloud control plane uh, into Kubernetes and used Flatcar as the underlying um, layer for that. And it's, it's almost like night and day in terms of how it was to manage the uh, traditional uh, you know, full Linux distribution that they were using before to how they will manage uh, on Flatcar, so they just don't think about the OS anymore, and they can focus on the, uh, the, the workloads that they're deploying on top. So, uh, so this, is, this is just like the, 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 what Flatcar is in a nutshell, and where it comes from actually is it derived from um, uh, an operating system called CoreOS Container Linux, uh, which goes back to 2013, and it itself was inspired by Chrome OS, uh, which came out of Google, and had applied a lot of these same concepts to desktop operating system for Chromebooks. That's how they make Chromebooks simple, secure, um, autom automatic updating, and basically translated a lot of those concepts into servers. Um, so, so we actually um, uh, decided to launch the Flatcar project as effectively a fork of um, CoreOS back in 2018 when the company behind CoreOS was acquired by Red Hat. And, Shortly after that, in 2019, um, I, I spoke at the, the last big in-person uh, Rejects event in San Diego and talked about Flatcar and really kind of introduced it to the cloud-native Rejects community. And that was one reason why we thought today would be a good day to come back and just kind of give you some updates on where the project's been and, and where it's going. Because you know, that's, believe it or not, two and a half years ago. Um, and there have been some pretty significant develops in developments in terms of the project in that time. So the, the first, and probably from many users' um, perspectives, the most important one was the original CoreOS container, container Linux reached end of life. And this was something um, that, you know, that we've been seeing was probably on the cards. And the reason why we introduced Flatcar was we wanted to enable a seamless migration path for users going forward who had deployed CoreOS. Um, and so, so that took place. Um, and then, more recently, 
the team behind um, Flatcar was based in Kinfolk, and we were acquired by Microsoft, in fact, pretty much a year, exactly a year ago. Uh, and you know, we had a lot of questions around that time about, well, what does this mean for Flatcar? We've got you know, a lot of users on it. Um, what's Microsoft's commitment to this? Uh, so um, you know, we headed off some of that at the time. Um, at the time the acquisition was announced, there was a blog post by Brendan Burns. And you know, he was very explicit in this. And in fact, through the acquisition talks, you know, we had the question put to us, how do we make sure we don't do a red hat on Flatcar? Because uh, we, don't, we don't want to, um, you know, we don't want this project to, to end. Um, we want to basically reassure the community that we're going to continue to work with them and to transition this to be a much more community-driven um, uh, oper operating system, much more community-driven uh, project. And you know, that was the commitment at the time, was that we as a team will continue to work with the community, and in fact, even kind of double down on that. And I'm gonna hand over to Tilo at this point to talk about how we've actually made that transition from vendor-led to community-driven. So Tilo, take it away. Uh, thanks, Andy. Yeah, that's an, that was an, uh, that's an exciting experience in phase for me, both as a nerd and uh, as an engineering manager. So. Um, the new position enabled us uh, to fully open up to the community um, because the requirement of having a, like a vendor drive in the project was gone. Um, so we opened up the build system. We made it technically, technologically, a lot easier to onboard a flat car. We containerized the SDK. So onboarding and development uh, is a lot easier. We container, uh, we simplify it and are still in the process, process of simplifying the build system so that it's easier um, to set up your own flat car uh, build if you so desire. We introduced community um, calls, like we have a monthly, call it office hours, where we um, show like the latest stuff that happen, happens in flat car. We have room for our users to speak up. We have folks visiting us, presenting, us, uh, presenting to us. And um, we also uh, like made the security process a lot more public. Um, that was something that was a subscription thing before. So we're involving the community. Uh, we're, having, we're having early notice um, out, and we're making sure that um, this this part is not premium. It's also co uh, covered in the in the community sector. Um, yeah, what else? Uh, the release planning was public, and that was an interesting experience uh, as, a, as the, the manager of the flat car team. So that was basically a internal meeting that we just put on Zoom and made it public and had other people um, joining us and uh, looking at how we did, how we conducted the release planning. So that was um, very exciting to see. And um, so some of the things that we achieved um, after um, disconnecting ourselves from CoreOS because CoreOS went in maintenance mode and uh, we just felt that we need to push innovation a little more um, than CoreOS did back in the day. We modernized um, almost all of the packages, uh, huge kernel updates, kernel version um, jumps. We had several major systemd updates, Docker updates, like the very, the very core. Um, as mentioned, we modernized the way the SDK works as well. Um, to just make, make it easier for people to contribute to Flatcar. There were a number of retirements that we did, so there was an edge channel which um, we took ex as experimental, and we didn't need that anymore at, at some point, because changes just went into alpha and then got mainlined. Um, and uh, we discontinued shipping the rocket container runtime, so everything's Docker-based now, and we're looking into new options in the future. SDK was really an important step for us, and there's still some work to do, but um, uh, the way Coros was built um, was pretty arcane, and it was hard to onboard. Um, it, was a, uh, it was a pretty, pretty um, tight learning curve, and right now it's as simple as cloning a repo and running a script, and you're basically in the SDK and can start developing. We introduced an LTS channel, um, so our stable releases usually, major stable releases usually um, go out every two to three months. And for some people, that is a bit too rapid, a update cycle. So we have a um, long-term support channel that holds over a year and only receives um, bug fixes and patch updates. Uh, we added GPU support. Um, right after deployment. Right now, this is, um, this is only for Azure, but work is on the way to generalize that and make it um, basically work on any platform um, with GPUs. 
We, um, we introduced FIPS, and that is important um, if you need certification and if you need um, your, your classes to, um, to check certain boxes. So Flatgrass supports uh, full FIPS mode. We worked a lot with, um, with upstream. So we have several upstreams, of course. Um, we did work with, um, with Gen2, where all of our packages are derived from. We do stabilization work for them. We fix boxes. We, fi we fix bugs. Uh, we uh, are working on Fed uh, with Fedora Core as folks on several key components, some of which we are currently using, which is um, Ignition, which we updated as well, um, some of which we are planning to use, which is bu Butane. Butane is a config transpiler that, um, yeah, uh, transpires human-readable YAML in a less human-readable JSON, which is fed um, to, to the provisioning process and um, configures flatcar instances. Uh, we've been working a lot with the cluster API and other Kubernetes projects. Uh, we have a lot of patches in Image Builder, and um, we've upgraded Ignition version 3, and we have backwards compatibility. That is something that um, Fedora Chorus choose not to do. Um, it's important for us that our users uh, just continue, uh, are able to continue uh, using um, our, our operating system without major changes. We understand the pain of, um, of um, operational work, and we basically want to keep that from users. So our Ignition ships with version 3, but also supports version 2. We've made a big jump into C groups v2, and um, since there still is a lot of um, friction and unreadiness for cgroups v2, particularly in the container world, world and the Kubernetes world, we still fully support version 1, and it can be configured so at provisioning time or at runtime. Um, we've added full support for ARM64, and we test regularly um, all of our releases on uh, Ampere, on uh, Graviton, and on the new Azure ARM64 offering. And we have support for EKS worker nodes on Amazon. So, some raw numbers. Um, since we detached from, from Chorus and basically learned to walk by ourselves, we have more than 300 bucks reported and fixed from users. Um, we have more than 250 packages upgraded. And um, all of Flatcar is basically 320 packages. So we went through a lot there. Uh, we had 35 major alpha releases um, since we detached in late 2019. And um, only in the last quarter, we had uh, 550 contributors interacting with Flatcar, with the um, GitHub project in some way, be it bugs being filed or um, even PRs uh, being, being filed. And Great. back to Andy. Thanks, Tilo. Yeah. So, as you can see, we've been doing a lot on the engineering side. The project team is really, you know, not not um, slowed down at all. If anything, has really accelerated, um, in, including over the last year. And you know, this this as translated, we've seen, you know, CoreOS supported already a lot of platforms. We've seen a lot more, um, you know, ecosystem partners coming in and integrating and enabling Flatcar as an as an OS. Um, you know, from obviously the, all of the major clouds through to um, the cluster API integration work that Tilo, he kind of glossed over that. That's been a huge uh, investment actually, working yep. with the cluster API um, upstream groups in VMware um, and in, in Microsoft and uh, across other companies as well. A lot of folks putting a lot of time and effort into cluster API as the new standard way of provisioning uh, Kubernetes clusters and Flatgar is you know, being supported out of the box now in, in cluster API, um, and, and really kind of ac across a wide number of, uh, of distributions. And we do see, you know, um, and I mentioned Kubernetes there, we did a survey recently, and we found about 80% of our users were actually deploying Kubernetes, but that also means that there's a good number that are not deploying Kubernetes, right? They, they take Flatcar for deploying containers in, you know, maybe, it's maybe they're just manually deploying uh, Docker onto uh, onto nodes and um, deploying containers in that way, and so there's some of that too. We, we're not Kubernetes exclusive, but it is the most important of the t of the environments. 
Now this is quite an interesting chart because I showed you that picture of me talking, standing in front of the cloud native rejects. And if you look at where we were on the adoption scale, it, it felt like we had quite a few users <laughs> back then. <laughs> but now you can't barely distinguish that from zero. You know. um, so you know, the, clearly through 2020, you know, the big driver was uh, the folks who had CoreOS deployed who needed a solution to migrate onto to continue getting security updates. But you know, even since then, you know, over the last 12 months, we've seen nearly 50% you know, year on year growth. Um, and, and that's coming from people that are, are choosing Flatcar, not because they had CoreOS and need something compatible, because, but because they want a great uh, uh, foundation for deploying uh, containers. And also, increasingly, people like the fact that this is you know, really community-oriented in the direction we're going with the project in, in really opening up to the community. Um, so you can see some logos of a lot of folks who've, um, you know, who have deployed and adopted and integrated uh, Flatcar, but it's with the, the kind of numbers here. I mean, we, I don't think we've shared these specific numbers before, but you, know, you can see we're up to like 50,000 um, that are pinging our update server, and you have to Bear in mind that that is a small subset of the total uh, deployed number, because a lot of people will not want to go to the public update server um, to, to pick up new, uh, new updates for a whole lot of reasons, including a lot of people are not necessarily applying updates, they're just redeploying, uh, you know, re-imaging nodes with a new version as it's available rather than doing in-place updates. Um, so, you know, so we, we see pretty good adoption there. So what do you, what do you attribute that growth to? Well, so we're riding the fact that Kubernetes is taking off, containers is taking off, the world is moving to containers, and the fact that you know a lot of people within that um, you know within the, that community are adopting Flatcar as a as a great basis for for that those deployments. You're a great straight man. <laughs> so we asked people, why, why are you adopting Flatcar? What do you like about it? Um, and security and manageability are the two big things. Um, so really, kind of the decision comes down to um, typically you know, a, a full uh, Linux distribution, an Ubuntu or a RHEL or something like that, right? Where, which has the advantage that it's well known, the, the folks know how to manage those nodes. Um, but you know, it doesn't have the same kind of characteristics I talked about early on with the immutability, automated updates, and, and these kind of things, and the manageability that comes from the way that we deploy nodes. Um, the, the fact it's small and lightweight, you know, integrates with the, the, the integrations that are there. There are other OSs that are around with, um, uh, you know, which support Kubernetes as well, but may, maybe are not supported across the breadth of um, uh, the, the breadth of platforms, and you know, I think you know, we, anyone who's worked in product knows, you know, the Net Promoter Score, particularly early on. Like, if you have users that love and have a great experience with your product, and go around recommending it to people, then word spreads, and that's how, how a lot of this has happened. Um, Looking ahead, uh, we've, there's a lot of things that we can still do. Um, we think you know, it's, it's important to, to, you know, to be clear that you know, we're not in the job of just like keeping core OS in maintenance mode and just kind of continuing exactly as it is and just applying some security fixes as they come out. You know, this is an active development project. Of course, the most fundamental thing we do is to do all of that basic maintenance and to ensure that we um, are keeping up to date with the latest releases and packages and everything, but there's a lot of work that's happening in the community beyond that, the cluster API work that I mentioned, but also, you know, we just heard about supply chain security. We need to think about, well, what does that mean for an operating system? How can we make our releases, um, you know, attestable and verifiable? Um, how can we integrate with, with the TPM hardware that's out there? Um, all of those kind of things, we're, uh, topics we're working on. Um, Slack channel may seem like a small thing, but a lot of people are saying to us, we want a Slack channel to be able to talk to you. So you know, the, we, we chose to use the Matrix um, open source uh, chat tool for our team chat and opening that up to the community because it seemed like an open thing. But you know, there's a lot of folks, particularly in the Kubernetes world, that have the Slack open. We, we've actually submitted to add a Slack channel into the Kubernetes um, 
uh, Slack. So you know, hopefully that'll be great. Unless it is already, do you know? Ah, uh, we no. miss one okay. sign off of an admin. Okay, then so we're, we're nearly there. Um, um, you know, and the other thing is just like growing the ecosystem. We've, I've had a lot of conversations with you know, with folks in the community from larger companies to smaller companies that want to get involved, put uh, contributors in um, into the project and really kind of integrate Flatcar into their products. And uh, so you're going to see more of that happening. Um, you know, and, and the other thing that comes up just because you know, we are now part of Microsoft and you know, Microsoft is open source friendly but is also a large company and there are a number of people that say to us, we would really like to see this having you know, more neutral governance and kind of guaranteed neutral governance. So we are looking at options for how might this uh, go into a foundation. So nothing to announce there, but it's, you know, it's certainly a direction that we, um, you know, we see makes, makes sense for this project, um, you know, given, given our strategy and what we're trying to, we're trying to do. Um, and you know, beyond this, I mean, everyone in this room, you know, everyone listening on the live stream, um, you know, you're welcome to participate. We've, you know, literally every aspect of the project is opened up now. You know, this, I'm talking about futures here in a summary form, but you can go click on that GitHub link and, and interact with all of the issues that are there um, and, you know, add your own request, add ideas for things you want to do, how you want to participate. You can join the monthly calls, you can join release planning, you can join the team Slack and interact directly with the engineering team. You know, this is, in, really, you know, we, we don't want to see this as something we control. We want to see this as, um, you know, really the, the, the communities contain Linux, right? This is, this is something that we want to be um, as a foundational element of the entire cloud native stack that the community can build on. So, uh, so I wanted to uh, wrap up there and hopefully a couple of minutes early. And, and really just see if there's any questions that we can uh, see it through to the next slot.